Thank you for joining us today for Dr. Zeke Emanuel's webinar called Vir Virtual Medicine, a Red Herring. I'm Caitlin O'Neill, Program Manager for Online Education in the University of Pennsylvania's Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy. Dr. Emanuel is Chair of the Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy and Vice Provost for Global Initiatives, as well as holding many roles of influence in healthcare today. And now, please welcome Dr. Zeke Emanuel. Fantastic. So let me start. And the first thing I was going to do uh, was uh, I was in the midst of defining a red herring. Um, uh, one ha one uh, definition is that a red herring is a herring that uh, turns red when it gets smoked. That's not the definition we're interested in. The definition we're interested in uh, is one that comes from a British uh, member of parliament and uh, pamphleteer and radical uh, politician who uh, said that uh, he used a red herring to divert the public or they're being diverted um, and that comes from a notion that the red herring would divert dogs chasing a hare or a fox uh, on the hunt. Uh, so a red herring is a seemingly plausible though ultimately irrelevant diversionary question or suggestion uh, which may be intentional or unintentional and I do think that a lot of stuff around virtual medicine and all it's going to do to fix the American healthcare system is a bit of a red herring diverting us from the real issue. Um, so let's go to Eric Topol who's a uh, professor uh, at uh, um, Scripps in San Diego and he says over the past decade smartphones have radically changed many aspects of our everyday lives from banking to shopping to entertainment medicine is next just as the printing press democratized information the medicalized smartphone will democratize healthcare anywhere you can get a mobile signal you'll have new ways to practice data-driven medicine patients won't just be empowered they'll be emancipated well is that true um, what do we mean by virtual medicine Let's begin. Uh, I think it's any use of big data, deep analytics, AI, machine learning, and or wireless and wearable technologies that in some combination are supposed to lead to improvements in the diagnosis and or the treatment of patients. That's what we typically mean by virtual medicine. Well, the question is, is it going to actually work? Sort of to give you the bottom line now, I think I think that it's not substantially involved in the physician-patient relationship. When it does get involved, it actually doesn't work particularly well. Um, big virtual medicine can work mainly in the background. You can have data aggregation, aggregating and analytics that can help with the uh, health team. You can coordinate health team uh, activity. You can actually evaluate the performance of health teams. But I think the fundamental diet, the physician-patient relationship, Virtual medicine is not likely to do a lot in that context. Why do I say that? Well, let's just go to a few studies that have recently been published. This is a 2016 JAMA internal medicine study where in California they randomized 1,500 patients with congestive heart failure into two groups. One group got usual care, one group got remote wireless monitoring, via blood pressure cuffs, a wireless scale, symptom management on their iPhone, all went to a, a nurse. Uh, they got health coaching phone calls uh, with a nurse, and if a nurse found anything unusual, would report it. And what was the result of said intervention? Well, basically, no change in 30-day mortality, um, and uh, or 30 day readmission rate and no change in 180 day mortality. It was basically a negative study. The remote monitoring with wireless blood pressure cuffs and scales and symptom management did not work. Then there's another slot, another study. Um, and that was a 2017 study, again in JAMA IM, trying to improve patient adherence to their drug prescriptions. CVS Caremark uh, randomized over 50,000 patients into three different arms. One had a pill box with strips with toggles, that is, you opened up every day's pills. Another had a digital timer cap. If you didn't open the pill cap by, say, 11 o'clock, it went off, alerted people. Um, and then a regular standard pill bottle, you unscrewed the top and took your pills. 
Uh, there was no difference in uh, medication adherence uh, in the three arms. Uh, as a matter of fact, the old style pill bottle with toggles was probably the best, although not really statistically or clinically significant. Next uh, study uh, showed that uh, in 2016, uh, this study looked at using activity trackers, among other interventions, on patients who were obese to decrease their ob obesity. Participants were placed on low-calorie diets, prescribed increased physical activity, uh, and had group counseling se sessions. And one group had a uh, track, uh, activity tracker that would helpful, hopefully motivate them. At six months, half the group began with their diet and activity uh, through a website, and half were given wearable devices to track their diet and activity. Those who use a wearable tech actually lost less weight than the people who sort of had a traditional uh, tracking. So again, another case where virtual medicine doesn't seem to play. And finally, there's a 2016 Lancet study investigated whether the use of activity trackers or loan or in with combination with bonnet various monetary incentives led young people 18 to 34 to increase their physical activity or improve other health outcomes. The results shown on the next slide were that uh, uh, after 12 months, there was no evidence of improvement in health outcomes. Those with financial incentives did improve their physical activity, but when you took away the financial incentive but left the Fitbit, uh, there was no increase in physical activity. In fact, uh, this was another case of where the actual change in behavior was because of incentives, not because of the wireless Fitbit device. So what do we learn from this? Uh, as one of the study leaders said, these devices have some really cool tech, but how do you use them in a way that helps people? Overall, it doesn't look like assigning someone wearable technology will make that big of a health difference. Um, and I think that is the bottom line of mo almost every study that we've had now. You cannot get people to either take their medication, uh, change their exercise, uh, actually uh, prevent hospital readmissions or mortality with uh, congestive heart failure. There are very few studies done in a rigorous peer-reviewed way that show any change by simply using wireless devices or virtual medicine. Why has virtual medicine failed? Well, I think the reason is that the big problem facing medical care is behavior change of physicians and patients. Virtual medicine doesn't lead to behavior change by itself. Remember, in the tech world, what you really want to do with all that data analytics, that AI, that machine learning, all of these wireless things, is sell people things, right? You want to crunch the numbers, find out what they like, and try to sell them. In medicine, you have a bigger challenge, which is we want to change their behaviors. We want to make them to eat, make people eat differently, exercise, take their pills, etc. That's harder, and that's not like advertising. I think virtual medicine is never going to replace a physician-patient relationship. It might supplement it, and it works best in the background, informing and in, in improving physician actions. We have seen some places where it works. Um, Take Kaiser Mid-Atlantic. It's a pioneer of virtual medicine, um, and yet only a small fraction of its, phys of its physician visits are conducted by video, uh, about 1%. Uh, and so I think it can supplement but not replace face-to-face clinician-patient interactions. And by the way, it uh, positively impacts convenience more than actually saving money in the case of Kaiser. One place where it has worked is when you can actually use it in a sort of low-tech, not high-tech way. This is the vice president of Iora Health, a uh, primary care startup in the United States, and he says the implementation of most electronic guidelines will cost a lot of money and it'll cause a lot of pain. And I think personally that video chat, uh, telemedicine is just a fancy phone call. But we find that the best use of IT by a wide margin is text messaging for follow-up of care. Did the patient get better? Did their cold go away? Did their urinary tract infection go away? Well, text messaging is hardly big, high-tech virtual medicine. So where do I think virtual medicine might work? Well, the, probably its biggest uh, place is in rural health. 
where it's hard to get doctors and other healthcare providers to work. Um, various other places it might work are on tele-ICUs, we'll talk about that in a second, behavioral health situations where patients can uh, talk to a therapist, MDMD consultations, taking a picture of a skin lesion or such thing and getting the uh, dermatologist to interpret it. Follow-up care, as we mentioned, with chronic conditions, mostly by texting, um, and minor care resolution where patients have questions. Banner Health is a good example of tele-ICU program where they've used Philips's tele-ICU solutions. Um, the program employs video cameras with audio hookup in every ICU room, and the cameras stream real-time uh, data like blood pressure, heart rate, uh, to an off-site tele-intensivist who monitors uh, the entire ICU. In the past 10 years, the program has expanded to provide services at 26 different Banner uh, facilities. They've had some impressive results. They've actually saved a number of lives by their own calculation. They've had 33,000 fewer ICU days, 47,000 fewer hospital days, and saved almost $90 million by saving lives and reducing intensive care unit days. Another place I think you might see it uh, is in mental illness. Lots of people in the United States have depression, anxiety disorder, um, and uh, we know that we have an undersupply of psychiatrists as well as other behavioral health specialists. There are only 28,000 psychiatrists in the United States for 325 million people, only about 100,000 uh, clinical health psychologists. So we need people uh, to do uh, behavioral health. There are companies in this space that are trying this. Quartet Health, a group with which I'm affiliated, has a virtual collaborative care model where technology has been used to diagnose patients, they give them surveys, uh, and treat patients with uh, uh, comorbid health issues. 40 to 50% of quartet patients are referred to a behavioral health specialist. They're seen within 12, 10 to 14 days as opposed to two or three months in the usual case. And those with more urgent health problems are seen more rapidly. Um, the uh, actual rate of uh, no-shows at these appointments is much less, 15% compared to a national average in uh, comorbid conditions of 40%. Uh, so this is a case of where uh, online connecting between doctors and patients may work, but it's connecting. Some of the therapy is online, but a lot of the therapy is in person. Bob Wachter, who's chairman of medicine at UCSF, has written, I think, very elegantly about virtual medicine. And he says, the simple narrative of our age that computers improve the performance of every industry they touch turns out to have been magical thinking when it comes to healthcare. In our sliver of the world, we're learning computers make some things better, some things worse, but they do change everything. And I think the idea of heavily investing in virtual medicine on the notion that it's really going to radically transform healthcare is probably a mistake. We should focus more on uh, computers helping doctors get information to manage patients, unless I'm putting computers and IT and uh, AI in between doctors and patients. So that's all I have. Uh, I want to remind people that we have a uh, uh, courses uh, available for people that go into these topics more in depth. I'll be teaching a course on transforming uh, the American healthcare system and how we can actually use different uh, techniques for it uh, uh, soon, uh, beginning on June 1st. Uh, but if you have questions, please uh, ask them now. Um, so one question is, how do you measure effectiveness and cost? Uh, well, you can measure effectiveness by, uh, for example, um, how do you uh, change patient behavior? Uh, as I mentioned, in one of those studies in congestive heart failure, by giving people wireless technologies, wireless blood pressure cuffs, wireless uh, scales, do we actually change their health status? Do we change their 30-day readmission rate? Do we, we change their six-month mortality rate with congestive heart failure? That is a sort of traditional uh, endpoint, uh, but we haven't been able to uh, achieve that uh, at all. Um, a second measure might be cost savings. If we substitute online interactions between the doctor and patient, do we actually reduce the number of in-person visits and does it reduce the total cost of care? 
So far, we haven't seen that. In the case of tele-ICUs, by reducing the number of hospital days patients spend in the intensive care unit and in the hospital, you can actually demonstrate some cost savings. So those are some of the more traditional methods by which you might measure the outcome of uh, uh, virtual medicine interventions. So one, I think, important point that I would emphasize now is the importance of trying to use uh, telemedicine in the context of um, rural health. Uh, no country, not Australia, not Canada, not Norway, not the United States, has really solved the problem of getting more physicians, more healthcare professionals in rural areas. And telemedicine, by connecting rural clinics or rural doctors, especially towards uh, specialist care, uh, can help. It's a way of getting uh, specialist consultations in the area uh, where there aren't a lot of specialists. Um, and I think this is probably its biggest and most effective interaction, and that's because of a dearth of doctors. Does forced patient involvement requiring a patient response improve adherence? I don't know that we force patient involvement. After all, if patients uh, don't text you back, or don't take an action, uh, it's unclear what the consequences, the negative consequences are going to be uh, for the patient. You wouldn't want to say, lock the pill bottle so they couldn't get the pills if uh, they didn't respond to some kind of question. Uh, it's not clear that uh, you can actually force patients uh, to do certain things like get on the scale or take their blood pressure. So exactly uh, what it means to force patient responses in this context is a bit unclear to me. Somebody asks, is there any indication that telehealth has different impacts for different generations, like baby boomers or millennials? Well, there was an interesting study in Singapore, a very wired place, trying to get uh, young people to increase their physical activity and, again, randomize them to wireless uh, Fitbits uh, versus no, uh, um, no high-tech interventions, no Fitbit. Um, and even though they were younger, more tech-savvy, you would think, than older people, did not have a big effect. Now, it had no effect, actually, no statistically significant effect in terms of increasing physical activity or decreasing food consumption. Uh, now, you might say, well, maybe when that generation grows older and has more serious health problems, they'll be more techno technologically savvy. That's always possible. But remember, uh, right now, 86 cents of every dollar for people with chronic conditions, most of those people the vast majority of those people are older, and at least for the next few decades, we're going to have to deal with that older generation. Um, and if they're not tech savvy, they don't interact with tech all the time. Uh, that's the generation we have to figure out how to connect with and how to change their behaviors. Um, and as I said, so far we have not a lot of evidence that today behaviors, even among younger people, change with technology, uh, wireless technology and such. Somebody asks, uh, is there any evidence of increased patient follow-up if appointments can be virtual rather than physical? Um, well, as the uh, start here said, one of the problems is that some of the technology doesn't work as we want it. Um, I have not seen data about the no-show rate uh, on uh, virtual interactions. I will tell you one of the problems of virtual interactions for uh, the doctor is if they end up running behind a little bit. If they can't make exactly at the start of 1 o'clock, it w doesn't work so well for patients. Um, and another problem that has been seen by trying to have more appointments or more emergency room calls off hours uh, virtually is that its convenience factor actually encourages a lot of use, not all of which is, you know, urgent care. Uh, it just might be more convenient for the mother to do it at 8.30. Her kids might like to see the doctor. Um, at, now, that might be helpful from a convenience factor, but it's not clear that it's actually addressing real health needs that can't wait to some other time or that won't just simply go away without the convenience. Uh, so there may be important convenience issues, but there could also be overuse of the technology when uh, it's made so easy.
Somebody asks, do you think that the situation might be different in pediatrics than with adult health care? Again, uh, <laughs> no evidence that that is the case, and I, I would remain skeptical. Um, uh, I do think it does help uh, in that it may be more convenient, especially for a parent who has multiple kids rather than going to a physician's office or an urgent care center or the emergency room. Um, but how much that also might lead to overuse is, I think, something we need to evaluate. And the second thing is how much that might uh, encourage use for uh, non-urgent problems that, say, resolve by the morning is another important question. Uh, somebody asks, is there evidence of increased patient follow-up if appointments can be virtual rather than physical? Again, I have never seen uh, uh, a consistent drop. I, as I mentioned in the uh, quartet with behavioral health, uh, using online connection with the patient, online scheduling, um, the no-show rate uh, for in for in-person interaction with the behavioral health specialist has dropped from 40% to 15%. But there's a lot of support that goes into that, uh, such as reminders and other things, which mostly are not very high tech. They tend to be you know, text messaging to a telephone. Uh, you don't need lots of virtual medicine for that text messaging. Um, so I do think we need to sort of differentiate using simple stuff like text messaging from more complicated um, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, wearables, and wireless tech. Um, again, uh, if, it, if it's all text messaging, getting you, reminding you of the appointment, getting you a Uber or Lyft, that's hardly high-tech virtual medicine. Uh, are there any current or ongoing studies about virtual medicine, and what's the level of interest or funding for it? Um, I would say that there's a substantial amount of uh, um, funding for various different uh, virtual medicine interactions. Uh, as you might imagine, a lot of the venture capitalists who've grown up around Silicon Valley and think tech solves a lot of things have heavily invested in this space. Some are trying different uh, interactions uh, via PBMs to try to get patients to renew their medications, ask questions about side effects um, via uh, 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 and have chatbots interact with patients to get, provide them information um, as just one example. Uh, I do think this is a case of where there remains a lot of interest, uh, but uh, there have not been proven me methods to actually solve problems. Another area where there turns out to be substantial interest is to try to use uh, some information or, or some platforms to get patients information about cheaper uh, facilities to use, cheaper labs to go to, cheaper imaging facilities uh, as an effort to save time and to connect with patients at the point of decision making. Uh, I think these are all promising, but again, the difference between promising and actually effective and cost reducing or quality improving is a big gap, and I think we need a lot more rigorous study. Um, and I don't think just around the corner is going to be a big virtual medicine solution to a problem. Um, and I would just um, remind you of, for example, you know, Apple has this great addition to its Apple Watch about detecting AFib, and it turns out not to be very uh, good at detecting AFib and should not be used for patients who have AFib uh, to monitor themselves. Uh, it's another case of where people thought there'd be a great intervention, you know, we could determine if patients are popping into AFib or not, and it turns out to be uh, uh, mostly uh, smoke and not a lot of uh, uh, real medicine intervention that is something we could rely on. Um, so that's why I entitled this talk, Virtual Medicine, a Red Herring. I think too much focus on this is taking us away from the key issues facing medicine, which are behavioral change, changing how p patients and doctors actually behave, uh, whether it's exercise or diet or medication adherence or adherence to physical therapy. And that's a bigger challenge than is going to be solved just by aggregating data using more wireless or wearable technology. Thank you very much. And let me remind you, uh, you will be receiving a, a coupon if you want to take additional, more in-depth courses than just can be offered in a quick half-hour webinar.